now we're recording. Uh, and yes, then I will post these to YouTube so you will have them. Okay, so to summarize, let me just re-summarize what I just uh, said here. Reshare the screen. Nope. Uh, there we are. So uh, what we're going to be talking about today is how we could take this property of birefringence that we see uh, in crystals that we use to build wave plates. So uh, for instance, like this calcite crystal here. Today we wanna to talk about how we could take materials that don't have this property and give them this property, make the index of refraction along different directions different. Uh, that is called, uh, going back to our first slide for today, induced by refringence. Uh, and that will lead into another topic called optical activity that we'll get to uh, next class. So how can we induce by refringence in a material? Uh, so for instance, sometimes all you have to do is put strain on a material. So a lot of like plastic components, like plastic cutlery or this tape dispenser here, uh, these are pictures that are taken with uh, light is being shined from behind uh, these plastic materials and then being collected by a camera that's kind of where we're sitting. Behind the plastic, there is a polarizer in one direction and then in front of the plastic, there's another polarizer at 90 degrees. So if the plastic wasn't there, the camera, the polarizers would block all light. And uh, we would just get a black picture. But as soon as we put the plastic in the way, uh, it starts letting some light through. So what this shows is that by kind of straining and molding the plastic, we're changing the index of refraction in a way that makes it different along different directions because the polarization of the light that comes through the first polarizer must be rotated somewhat if it's also making it through that second polarizer. So one way we can change the index of refraction in material along different directions is by straining it. It's kind of the takeaway there. And more or less, uh, the more applicable, applicable ways to do this are by inducing strain in some other way. So for instance, uh, one application here is called the uh, uh, Pockles effect. And in this case, we strain a material by applying an electric field. And what that does is it kind of causes all of the uh, atoms in the material to polarize. And that polarization induces a change in, in the index of refraction. So along one direction, perhaps maybe this direction here along the electric field, the index of refraction will be different than for light that's polarized like out of the screen right now. So this these different index of refractions are mostly always due to some type of asymmetry that you have to kind of strain a material either with an electric field or just with a physical force to get it to happen. So, but when it's done with an electric field like this, it's called the Pockles effect. And so the basic idea, we could think of setting up an experiment like this. We take two polarizers. The first one just takes our unpolarized light here and polarizes it vertically. And then we have a second polarizer here. This is sometimes called an analyzer in an optics experiment, but it's just a, another polarizer. And in between, we could put a material, uh, what we call an electro-optic medium, that's rotated 45 degrees relative to the polarizer. And somehow, we could apply a voltage to it, maybe by like putting it inside of a capacitor or something. And by applying this voltage, we could use that to kind of change the polarization of light. So you see like before the voltage, the light goes through and its polarization isn't altered at all. But once we apply the voltage, we could induce a phase shift between the horizontal and vertical components of the light's polarization. And for instance here, convert the light from linear to circularly polarized. So this uh, whole type of situation is one of the ways in which we actually control the polarization of light in a lab. And it's really useful because uh, you can actually characterize how much voltage do you need to cause a phase shift of a certain amount 
to convert from like linear to circular or linear to elliptical or to rotate your linear polarization. So it provides like a numerical, quantitative, and electronic way to change the polarization of a light source. Uh, so it's really applicable in a lab setting. Uh, it's essentially a tunable wave plate, if you want to think about it that way. And really, the voltage can be applied in a lot of different directions, even along the direction of propagation. So if we had like transparent uh, electrodes for our capacitor, we could have them on either side of the, on either this side and this side of the plate as well. As long as you can apply a voltage to strain the material, you can get this effect to work. Uh, any questions so far on this idea? No. No. All right. Uh, then, like, just kind of quantifying this, basically, the phase shift that we get in this kind of induced wave plate is proportional to the voltage you apply. So there's more or less like an experimental relationship here. Uh, so here the phase shift, and this is the shift between light polarized uh, vertically, the vertical compolar component of the polarization, so EY uh, versus EX. It's proportional to the voltage you apply to these capacitor plates, if you want to think of it that way. That voltage is V, and the denominator here is what is called the half wave voltage. That's how much voltage you need to apply to get a phase shift of pi. And that basically is determined just by the properties of the material and the wavelength of light that you're using. So the, that half wave voltage is proportional to the wavelength. So the longer wavelength, the higher voltage you need to induce this effect. And it's inversely proportional to the ordinary index of refraction of the material. So the before you apply the voltage, that's what n naught is. So it's inversely proportional to n naught cubed. And then there's this experimental constant that's called R63. It's called the electro-optic constant of a material. It's actually part of a matrix, but we're not really going to get into like the theory here uh, of the materials physics. But note that this is R63 is a materials constant determinant that determines basically how strain how much how susceptible the material is to being strained like this by a voltage uh, the basic materials you use are different types of materials of glass or plastic which are kind of uh they're written here in like uh acronym form uh, but more or less, the actual materials are not the really important thing. What I want you to notice are the half wave voltages. So basically, how much voltage do you need to apply to cause a phase shift of pi between the X and Y components? And basically, you'll see is that you need a really high voltage to do this. So the voltage kind of in the kilovolt range. For most materials, it, it ranges between three kilovolts and nine kilovolts. So you really need like a, a high voltage source to be able to do this. That being said, it is possible. So uh, from here, uh, what kind of are the applications of this? So one of them, uh, actually the reason I'm talking about this because it's really useful in a, in laser physics to make pulsed lasers. Uh, and that's because you can use this to kind of, you can use this effect to modify how much light you get out of a laser and use it to make, you know, really short pulses of laser light that have really high power. Uh, the only trick is, is that in order to do that, with most of these applications, you have to have a a voltage supply that you can oscillate between zero volts and like 9,000 volts in on the order of nanoseconds. So it's a really tough application, but it's possible and done in a lot of uh, commercial pulsed laser systems. To give you an idea of like what this is, basically a laser is a light amplifier, as we'll talk about later in the semester, but 
more or less what you can do is you can use this type of uh, effect. You can put like a, a material in one of these capacitor structures in the path of the light inside the laser. And you can make it, you could put a polarization sensitive mirror inside the laser as well that lets light out for a certain polarization and not another. So basically, if you're able to control the polarization of light, you're able to turn the laser on and off really quickly on the order of nanoseconds if you can oscillate that voltage on that capacitor uh, really quickly. So for instance here, we could control the polarization of our light such that none of the light gets out of the laser. So that means uh, what we call the cavity loss here is 100%. It's all the light in the laser is kind of just lost to heat inside the material. And then we let all of the, uh, uh, inside the laser, there's also a material called the gain medium. And this is the thing that amplifies the light. So we let a lot of energy build up in that gain medium, essentially let all the electrons in the material in the gain medium go to high energy levels, but they can't give away their energy because basically the Pockel cell blocks light from getting out of the laser. But then at a certain point, if we could change that voltage really quickly, we could drop that loss down to zero. And all of a sudden light can get out of the laser. So it allows a huge pulse of light to come out of the laser. And then eventually all of those electrons fall to low energy levels and uh, the light in the laser, they all fall out at once and light coming out of the laser drops to zero. So we lose a lot of the ability to amplify light and then the light we get out of the laser drops to zero. And then this whole process repeats and this allows us to make like a pulsed laser system. Often like a lot of uh, laser writers or things where you have like really high intensity laser for short periods of time work on this principle. Uh, and this principle allows you to make pulses of light that are really like only on the nanosecond scale. Uh, generally, the shortest, you can, shortest pulses you can get with this type of structure is like 10 nanoseconds. Uh, so to kind of see how this works, uh, basically what's inside the laser looks like this. So one of these tunable wave plates that work off this effect called the Pockels effect is called a Pockels cell. So basically it's set up to work, uh, so we put a, we polarize all of the light. We put a polarizer in the laser, so it's only giving off like polarized light. And if the Pockel cell is activated, what happens here is that light is able to get through, hit a mirror in the laser, and its polarization is rotated so that when it hits this kind of uh, polarization sensitive mirror, light is sent out of the laser. It's sent like out this way where it might just hit a wall. And this would be the case where, you know, light is rejected and the light in the laser is just blocked and all the energy is stuck in there. But then for instance, we could switch that voltage really quickly on our tunable Pockel cell wave plate and change the polarization of the light inside the laser. So then uh, this polarization sensitive mirror actually lets the light out and uh, then we're able to get the energy out, and that's kind of what creates our pulse that comes out of the laser. So this is really one, just kind of one commercial example of this tunable wave plate effect. Uh, so any, before we move forward, uh, any questions on this idea? What any of these symbols mean? how it relates to previous stuff we talked about. Nope. Nope, okay. So then there's kind of a different, there's other ways to kind of get the same effect to happen as well. And generally, depending on how it's done, they're given different names. So some materials, what we were just talking about before with the Pockles effect, the polarization change that you get is proportional to the voltage. 
Uh, there's other materials where the polarization uh, change is proportional not really to the voltage or the electric field, but to the electric field squared. And really, it just depends on the type of material you have. When it's proportional to the electric field squared, however, it's called the Kerr effect. So usually this is due not to like separating the electrons and nuclei of an atom, but more like stretching the electron cloud kind of like so. If this effect happens, or if you have like molecules that have elongated shapes like this, chances are the polarization rotation is proportional to uh, the electric field squared that you apply to the material. And this gives us, again, birefringence. Along this, light polarized along this direction, we'll see a different, accent, different index of refraction than light polarized, for instance, along this direction. Usually this is written in terms of, uh, the Kerr effect is thought about not in terms of phase shift, but really in terms of just uh, change in index of refraction along one direction and the other. The amount of the difference in the index of refraction depends upon the wavelength that you're using. So this is wavelength and vacuum. K is an experimental constant of the material. The bigger it is, the more susceptible the material is to this effect. And then this is the electric field squared. Uh, so essentially, uh, E naught squared, that's kind of basically our irradiance. And this other constant is written as N2. Uh, but the constant K is, this is often the version that's useful here. Uh, that K is the Kerr constant of the material. So essentially what it's saying is the change in index of refraction between one direction and the other is proportional to the electric field squared and proportional to the wavelength of the light that you're using. So this is useful mostly because this allows us to kind of switch things even quicker. Because now what we can think of doing is basically, we can think of taking like some light source and hitting a material with some intensity of this light and inducing this effect, causing a very quick you know, stretch of all the atoms. And then we can send in a separate light source right after that and polarize it however we want, as long as we could time things effectively. This, is most, this effect is most common and most useful in uh, liquids. Uh, so this table I found, I don't know, they're not using SI units here, they're using CGS units, where the, uh, instead of volts, they use a unit called stat volt. So, but really why I'm posting this table is just to show you the type of materials in which you see this effect. So more or less organic, organic liquids, this is very common. So benzene, uh, chloroform, another, another great use for chloroform other than just knocking people out. And basically, if you do this, we could do this with really high short pulses of light. And uh, when we do this, it's often called the optical care effect or the AC care effect, mostly because the electric field is oscillating. In time. Uh, yes, Carrie. Oh, no, I'm good. Sorry. Oh. Any questions on, on this? Okay, so uh, from here, just let me, this next is like an idea of the type of experiment this is used for. Uh, so for instance, if we wanted to control the polarization of a laser beam or see how a material changes or affects polarization of light, the optical care effect allows us to design experiments that can do that. So for instance here, we could do an experiment with two laser beams. One is called the pump beam and the other is called the probe beam. So basically what we could do, it's like we can imagine our sample here is for instance, like a liquid crystal or something where we have really long elongated molecules. We could then take a really high power laser pulse uh, that's polarized at 45 degrees, uh, that would be like kind of 
as shown here, and direct it and focus it onto our material. What this does is induce a Kerr effect. It causes all the crystals to align on a certain direction and makes it uh, temporarily birefringent. So then a little bit later, if we could send in this second pulse of light, maybe delayed by a few nanoseconds or so, we could send it through the material and the polarization of this second light source would change. And using a second polarizer to measure that polarization change, uh, we could then see the effect of, uh, of the moving crystals. So you could think of doing some like really cool experiments here where, for instance, you could change the time between the pump and the probe pulse and measure the polarization of the light that gets through to the detector on the other side. And as you change the time between these two pulses, uh, you'll see the polarization, the probe, polarization of the probe beam change. And essentially what you're seeing is, you're seeing, if you record all this data, all those crystals align and then slowly misalign. As you make the time between the pump pulse and the probe pulse longer and longer and longer, uh, you're, you'll see your polarization change on the probe pulse. And that corresponds to the crystals all reorienting and going back to their kind of random initial distribution. Uh, this would be an example of something called polarization spectroscopy. And uh, the, this is really useful because mainly it allows you to basically measure the time scales of things like molecular motion, which is something that if you just do you know, normal experiments where you don't have this fast control of polarization uh, that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. So it allows you not just to measure static effects, but to measure, you know, how long uh, it takes certain molecules to move and reorient. So it's really useful in a, a lot of chemistry and material science and physics labs. Uh, but it's all an application of this idea of the optical care effect that we can induce a polarization or an index of refraction by refringence and thus rotate the polarization of a light source uh, and see how that changes in real time. In an actual experimental lab, the way this type of experiment would work uh, in order to slow down one pulse, the pro pulse from the pump pulse, one of them might be on a, hit a mirror that's on a movable stage and we can move that mirror back and forth by a few millimeters in steps and then take a data point each step. Uh, so it's a pretty neat idea. Uh, so basically, I mean, for our class today, this was originally a lecture I was going to do after spring break, and it was more or less just kind of a lecture discussing these two applications of controlling polarization. So, Basically, if we, uh, what I'm going to do is in the end, I'm going to kind of, we're going to talk uh, in our next class about this other thing called optical activity, which is like a slower version of this effect. But as far as problems go, what I'm going to assign for this, uh, I'm going to give you kind of one problem here, one where you're building a static wave plate, kind of like the problems we did in group problem solving before break. And then part B here in this problem number two, we'll be trying to figure out what the halfway voltage needs to be for a particular material given some parameters. So really all I'm going to be expecting you to do with this information is kind of work with some of the formulas uh, on the slides here. So in particular, this one and uh, this one. So uh, as, as for material for today, that's what I got. I think I prepared some that was a little bit too short, but hopefully we'll eventually get, uh, figure out just how much I need. Uh, for our next class, we're gonna be talking about a similar effect called the Faraday effect, which controls polarization. Those of you that have taken advanced lab might have done an experiment on this, so you may have already known some, something about it. But, uh, are there, so are there any questions on these two ideas, Kerr effect, Ockel's effect?
No, well, if it if not, then I guess we can kind of finish for today. Uh, if you guys saw, I could uh, stop recording uh, soon and then send this like post this lecture to the YouTube channel, and you could go back to it anytime you want. Uh, so, but if there aren't any questions, I will. Oh wait, Brendan has a question. Uh, how do you? Did you send it a link to the YouTube channel? Uh, I think I did, but I'll send it again. Maybe it only went to my other class. Okay. But I'll send you a link to the video once it's up, and that'll give you a link to the channel. Thank you. Yep. Uh, you know, we'll see how this goes. I mean, this, this material here is really more just like two applications of, of wave plates and polarization control. Uh, Beyond this lecture, we're not going to be coming back to it a lot, but it's kind of some interesting applications of this idea. As for the next class, we're going to talk about this thing called the Faraday effect and how it can be used to split light into or control the uh, phase between right and left circularly polarized light. So that's what we will do on, uh, on Wednesday. And uh, how that plays into the Faraday effect. And then on Friday, we'll discuss how we can represent uh, polarizers and such with matrices and kind of simplify our analysis using some matrix mathematics. So if that's it, I will stop share of the screen and uh,